Dr. Chopra is a credentialed, respected physician who has paid his dues as a modern doctor. He is an endocrinologist, formerly the chief of staff of New England Memorial Hospital and head of a large Boston area private practice. Dr. Chopra has lectured in 25 countries on how we can heal ourselves. He does not discard the current physically based approach. This new healing includes and goes beyond that, combining both modern science and ancient wisdom. Let's now join Dr. Chopra in mid-discussion at a recent seminar hosted by Dr. Donald Curtis and Reverend Dorothy Curtis at the Unity Church Educational Series in Dallas. Sometimes there are glass partitions between the fish tanks. After a while you can remove the glass partition, but the fish are unable to now move from one tank to another. They've made a commitment in their body-mind that that's as far as they can go. About 20 years ago, two physiologists from Harvard did a very interesting experiment in which they brought up a group of kittens in a room that had only horizontal stripes. In other words, all the visual stimuli in the room had just horizontal stripes. In another room, they brought up a group of kittens and the room had only vertical stripes. When these kittens grew up to be wise old cats, it turns out that one group of cats could not see anything other than a horizontal world. Another group of cats could not see anything other than a vertical world. So one group of cats would bump into things like furniture legs, not because they didn't believe in their existence, but because when their brains were examined, they didn't have the interneuronal connections, the connections between neurons, to either see a horizontal world or a vertical world. So all these experiments point to a very crucial fact. In fact, point to several crucial facts. Number one is that our sensory experience, which is with what we perceive the world, actually develops in response to those stimuli that we were exposed to in the first place. Our initial sensory experience structures a certain anatomy of the nervous system and then the nervous system does only one thing. It keeps reinforcing that same initial sensory input which has now become a belief system. In other words, the expression seeing is believing is physiologically not correct. It's the other way around. Believing is seeing. You develop a concept, a notion, an idea, a thought as a result of the interpretation of certain sensory stimuli at a certain age. And then the nervous system has only one function. It edits out anything that doesn't reinforce what has now become a belief system. So the nervous system now begins to just do that. Keep reinforcing what has now become a belief system. Right now, this very moment, this second, 99% of the people in this room will edit out more than one billion stimuli in this room. Most nervous systems will take in less than one billionth of the stimuli that are present in this room at this second. Those are the ones that reinforce your belief of what you think exists out there. If you don't believe it exists out there, if you don't have the notion for it, if you don't have the belief system for it, if you don't have any idea about it, then your nervous system will edit it out. It won't even get in there. It's a very astonishing fact of physiology. So at least it points out one thing very clearly. We cannot trust our senses. Our senses, which everybody seems to feel are the crucial test of reality after all this use expressions is when I see it I'll believe it or when it happens then I'll know about it. But the fact is anatomically that's a total misconception of the way things happen. We cannot trust our senses and sensory experience is not the crucial test of reality. Sensory experience is not the crucial test of reality. 
Sir John Eccles, who's a very well-known neurophysiologist and won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, he says, there are no colors in the real world. There are no textures in the real world. There's no beauty, there's no ugliness, no fragrances, nothing of the sort. They're all structured in our consciousness. Out there is a chaos of energy soup. And out of that chaos of energy soup, we structure a perceptual experience of a world with colors and fragrances and tastes and smells and textures and the whole mechanics of creation is really inside us, not out there. This is becoming a physiological fact that scientists are talking about. Einstein, for example, made the observation. He said there are no observables in the world picture, only sense impressions. A long time ago, Oscar Wilde said, the picture of the world is not the look of it, it's our way of looking at it. Now we realize that he was not making a metaphorical statement, but a very literal one. And it's true, not only of us as human beings, it's true of all living species everywhere. I gave you those experiments with the flies, the fleas, the monkeys, the cats, etc., the elephants. Their perceptual experiences are also structured in their consciousness as a result of initial sensory experience, which then subsequently reinforces initial sensory experience. The eye cells of a honeybee, when they look at a flower, they cannot see the same light wavelengths that you and I see. But they are sensitive to ultraviolet light, so when a honeybee looks at this flower, it won't see this flower. All it will see from a distance is the honey, if there's any inside. A snake would experience that as infrared radiation. A bat would experience that as the echo of ultrasound. And a chameleon's eyeballs, two different axes, you can't even remotely imagine what that look, would look like to a chameleon. So what's its real look? What's its real nature? What's its real structure? Ask a physicist and he'll say one of two things. Either he'll say there's no such thing or he'll say it's infinite possibilities. It's pure potentiality. And what we do is we freeze a field of possibilities into a certain perceptual experience according to preconceived notions or what psychologists say. They call this phenomenon premature cognitive commitment. Premature because it is premature. It's based on some initial interpretation of a certain sensory experience. And cognitive means to cognize, to perceive. Commitment means to commit yourself to a certain reality. The word premature cognitive commitment is a very good word because it implies that when in fact there are infinite possibilities, we freeze the infinite possibilities in a moment of frozen attention into this or that object. And then we are committed to that perceptual reality forever. That's how perception is. And it comes about from a superstition basically and that superstition is the superstitionalism which says that the crucial factor or the crucial test of reality is sensory experience. Based on that our entire scientific model has developed over the last hundred years. Our scientific model of how the biology functions is really, really based on the superstition of Newtonian physics, which says there's a physical world out there and if this exists at all, it is an epiphenomenon. In other words, human bodies are physical machines that have somehow learned to think. There's some dance of molecules inside the brain and as a result of that dance of molecules, this epiphenomenon is produced, which we call thought which we experience as feeling, emotion, desire, instincts, drives, intentions, attitudes, likes, dislikes, prejudices. All this, all these feelings, all the things that we experience as love, compassion, etc., according to the Newtonian superstition, is just the dance of molecules. We are physical machines that have learned how to think. And this model then sees the human body as a frozen sculpture, fixed in space and time, where literally 
the entire approach becomes completely and totally materialistic. We have frozen bullets, literally, to treat the frozen sculpture, magic bullets. If you can't believe you ate the whole thing, don't worry, all you have to do is take a couple of Alka-Seltzer. If you can't go to sleep at night, then you can take a sleeping pill, it will cure your insomnia. If you're feeling anxious, take a trailer, it will give you tranquility. If you have an infection, take an antibiotic and that will get rid of the basic reason why you have the infection. If you have chest pain, you can pop a nitroglycerin, better still have a bypass operation. If you have cancer, you can have chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, etc. These are the magic bullets of medicine based on the superstition of materialism. They're supposed to get rid of disease, but they don't because most of the time they are purely symptomatic approaches. They cover the symptoms of disease while the underlying process goes on. Or at best, they may interfere with the mechanisms of disease. And somehow people have confused, even scientists, have confused the mechanisms of disease with the origins of disease. The mechanisms of disease are not the origins of disease. So you can with the mechanism of disease. You say, I'll interfere with the multiplication of bacteria. That's how an antibiotic acts. But then bacteria develop alternative metabolic pathways. And you get antibiotic resistant organisms. It's estimated, for example, that in the United States, 100,000 people die per year in this country, according to statistics from the California Medical Association, as a result of antibiotic resistant organisms that are acquired in hospitals. 36% of all patients in hospitals suffer today from what is called iatrogenic disease, which means disease as a result of technical medical intervention. In the last 10 years, there has been an increase of 50 to 200% in certain types of cancer, and one of the emerging causes of cancer is the treatment of cancer, which renders a host completely immunocompromised by destruction of the immune system. Every 24 hours in the United States, Canada and the United Kingdom, 80% of the population swallows a medically prescribed chemical. So we have really allowed the superstition to completely override all logic to the extent that today we still believe that the cure to AIDS, to cancer and to all the diseases that mankind has today is some bullet out there, some material agent out there. It's based on the model of the human body. In fact, a recent commentary from a social scientist at Harvard, he made the comment, he said, the pain, dysfunction, disability and anguish resulting from technical medical intervention now rival the morbidity due to traffic and industrial accidents and even war-related activities making the impact of medicine one of the most rapidly spreading epidemics of our time.